Metroid Other M? Is it a masterpiece? Or a total disaster? We're about to find out. But first, let me tell you a story of a young frog in the year 2010. So, I was very excited about Metro Other M, as I've seen a trailer for the game and often would browse the website for the game to see if some new information had shown up. I had also read interviews with Yoshu Sakamoto. In this interview, Sakamoto would boast how amazing this game would be and how we'd learn more about Samus and her backstory. And we would also learn what she was like as a person and what her thoughts were about her journey. This was all fine and dandy, but there was something that caught my interest. It was how the game drew inspiration and would be similar to Super Metroid. In fact, possibly even better according to Sakamoto. As my excitement grew, I decided to pre-order the game. This was the very first game I pre-ordered, so one could say I had high expectations of the game. Then, the game came out and I was eager to play. Was the game any good though? We're about to find out. Fair warning that this review contains story and boss spoilers. The game begins with a lengthy cutscene where Samus wakes up in the middle of the Mother Brain fight from Super Metroid. Here we are introduced to Samus' first ever voice acted thoughts. Baby. I sure hope you like that because we are going to hear about it a lot. If you have ever played Super Metroid, you know how this goes. Then Samus wakes up and starts narrating the ending of Super Metroid despite us just watching what happened. Thanks to the Hyper Beam, which was given to me somehow by the baby. I laid Mother Brain to waste. She is then told to come with the person waking her up as she enters her room and we get to start controlling Samus for the first time. This is the game's tutorial room and we are given a few simple instructions as the game teaches us the ins and outs of the game. This is a good time to mention that the game was produced by the help of Team Ninja, famous for the 3D Ninja Gaiden games. Very noticeable as the game introduces finishing moves and special attack cutscenes where you lash onto enemies. You can also dodge by charging your weapon, then pressing the gamepad at the right time to dodge an attack. Yeah, you heard me right. For some reason they felt it was a good idea to let you control Samus in a 3D environment with a control pad. Some find this to be rather clunky, while others don't. Personally, I find it to be annoying at times, while it works fine at other times. The game also teaches us that we can lock onto targets and shoot them with missiles by pointing the Wiimote towards the screen while making the game go into a first person view. Sounds great on paper, but while doing this you are completely vulnerable to attacks. Unless you dodge the enemy's attack with the dodge move mentioned earlier. Last, the game shows us how to use power bombs. And I sure hope you remember it, because we won't be using them ever again for the time being. Then. We are quote unquote rewarded with a cutscene of Samus telling the Federation the job is done and she sets out on her merry way. Until she intercepts a distress signal and we get to hear the word baby five more times, like that wasn't already enough. Then the game's title pops up and the cutscene resumes. We are introduced to the space station we will spend the rest of the game on, and funny enough, it looks similar to the station in Metro Fusion. I sure hope this game will basically be Metro Fusion in 3D! After Samus lands on the station, the cutscene is finally coming to a close, and we finally get to control Samus on our own again. HA! The yoke is on you, because we are forced into a third person view, where we need to locate a certain small piece of the screen, and it's rarely obvious where to look. These things suck and we are forced into several throughout the game. The worst part about them is that the thing we are supposed to locate are so small and rarely indicated as we hover around them. In fact, the first time I played the game, I spent several minutes not knowing where to look, despite hovering near and exactly at the spot I was supposed to target. Of course, if you know where to find them, they are easy to target, but as a mechanic for new players, it's complete garbage, with rarely any hints on where the target is. Once this is done, we get another cutscene, and once it's over, we get to play the game for a whole whooping 15 seconds before the next cutscene begins. Believe me, I counted. Anyhow, 
We run into the Galactic Federation force that are on the ship, and we meet Adam Malkovich. For those who do not know Samus's past with her former commander, and how he sacrificed himself to save her, was a huge selling point for the game. We are also introduced to another character that opens his helmet and says the word. Remember me? No, I don't remember you! I don't even know who you are! This turns out to be someone Samus knows from her past, and we get some flashbacks to the past. Then we are finally able to control the game for a while, as Samus says. Despite never authorizing it, she's going to stick around. So, we make it through the corridors and rooms until we reach a huge room where a cutscene happens alongside the first boss of the game. There is no way of damaging it, and in order to know its health, Samus must scan the boss by tarring its weak spot in the first person mode. This mechanic stays the same for all the bosses, but it makes some sense to the game's universe. Adam authorizes the Ice Pistol for his troops, as well as missiles for Samus, and here we get a major issue with Samus as a character. You see, in this game to stop the player from breaking the entire game with Samus' abilities from Super Metroid, they must be authorized by Adam in order for her to use them. This makes sense game mechanically, but there are two problems that come with this. First of all is Samus as a character and how it breaks her entirely, and secondly of all is how incredibly careless Adam is with this and how often he's jeopardizing her life thanks to it. For example, you have her running through a volcano before allowing her to activate her varia suit to protect her from the heat. Samus is not allowed to use anything unless Papa Adam says it's okay first, but especially not power bombs, as they are too dangerous and might vaporize any survivors, despite the explosion doing absolutely no damage against the structures. Of course, this is to remove any free exploration which this game has none throughout the main game. I'm not even joking here. This game is the most linear metro game, and there are absolutely no free exploration at all, since every door at the save point is locked until Samus uses the save room, where she also gets the next section of the map. Fine, it's a man-built station, so maps are available, but game mechanically for a game that is known for its exploration, this is just stupid and shows that Sakamoto lost his touch with what the Metro series was all about. As the boss is defeated, we are allowed to stick around on the ship as long as we follow Papa Adam's orders to the smallest detail. So, we run and power up the elevator, and then we set out for it ourselves. Samus, go through the hatch on your right and head towards Sector 1. Lyle went ahead to secure a route to a facility of interest. I'll leave you to survey Sector 1. And it's here it will become the most clear that this game is basically a slimmed down, worse Metro Fusion in 3D. Which is an insult to Metro Fusion, as that's an actually good game. In fact, the game has 3 out of 6 areas of Metro Fusion. We have Sector 1 in Other M, that is basically Sector 2 from Metro Fusion with its tropical forest setting and key hunters. Sector 2 is an ice sector, just like Sector 5 was in Metro Fusion. And last, we have Sector 3 in Other M, that is exactly like Sector 3 in Metro Fusion. A scorching desert with volcanic fire areas. These three sectors and their themes aren't bad on their own, but I would rather have taken more main areas for the game, or perhaps a water area or the ice area to go with the classical Metroid area theme. As you progress in the game, you get more and more abilities authorized, and sometimes you even get a new ability never seen before, like the 3D spread beam, that basically targets several different foes at once. And that's it to the new abilities, as everything else has been seen in other Metroid games before, with the exception of faster beam charging and quarter energy tanks. Yeah, you heard that right. Quarter energy tanks to make the game more like Zelda, because we still need lots of collectibles despite having less energy tanks than usual. There are also the emergency energy refilling tanks as well, that lets you refill more energy tanks when you are in critical health and are about to die. I have to give the game some credits with the beam weapon though, and it's the wave beam. It looks beautiful with its spirals in this game. As well as getting new abilities authorized, you get new story bits revealed as well as Adam's soldiers dying off one by one, even introducing one of them as a traitor to keep the intrigue going. Until I found out who it was, I decided to call the traitor the deleter. <laughs> Granted, this also includes major plot holes and story inconsistencies that makes no sense. For example, as Samus goes around the station looking for a mystery creature that keeps evolving into a lizard-looking creature, 
She eventually finds herself in a furnace with none other than her old foe Ridley, which has been resurrected. Here, her PTSD activates as she sees Ridley and she is reminded about the time he killed her entire family and let her live just like she had done in Ridley's baby form. It strikes me as odd, as she has fought against Ridley time and time again with him being killed and eventually resurrected again. Another example near the end of the game, you learn that the Galactic Federation is breeding an engineered Metroid that is resistant to ice. Adam claims here that they are basically unkillable, despite dying to one or three power bombs. And enter Sector Zero, which has been cock-teased by the games prior to cause enough damage to it, so it separates from the station and blows itself up. Leave it to me. I'll deal with this place. Granted, if you put two and two together at the end of the game, you can figure out why he does this, but the game forgets to remind the player of this, leaving fans of the series to even question Adam's sacrifice in the first place. The game also builds up Adam as the potential traitor when he suddenly stops responding to Samus, making her use abilities that has yet to be authorized. Any objections, Adam? Exploration in this game is basically none, as every pickup is marked on the map after killing every enemy in the room. This is not that too bad unless you beat the game and every pickup is revealed on the map, removing all exploration. It would have been better if you could find certain map rooms, which would showcase a couple of pickups in the surrounding area, but nope. All is revealed. At least you get to explore the entire station and find few areas never touched upon in the main game, but it's very little and too late, as by the point most people would turn to another game. Funny enough, you can't 100% the game in the main game, only during the post game. The only difference to 100% is that the secret final boss is stronger if you have 100%. Personally, I find the game's strength to lie in the bosses, at least half of them, as out of all the bosses in this game, there's only one that's interesting out of the newly created bosses, while the best ones are bosses that has returned from previous Metroid games. Beware of boss spoilers! Brogmas slash Emperor Brog the very first boss of the game, which is a manifestation of many bugs solidifying or a rather bigger bug with an eye. Pretty decent for a first boss to teach you how the controls work, and what to expect out of the game mechanically in a boss battle. Overall the sign is rather disappointing though, and the fight is rather short and dull in itself. Not even sure if I would call this a boss to be honest, more like a mini boss to me. Very similar to Botwoon from Super Metroid, with the exception there are two snakes this time. They pop up through the holes in the room and eventually come out with their entire bodies to attack you. Very dull fight, and more like a waiting game than anything else. Kinky Hunter. Another boss I would rather call a mini boss, over it being an actual boss fight, as all you really need to do is to kill all the key hunters waiting for flower pots to open so you can break them making the main flower to fall down and to open up revealing King Key Hunter and blasting him with missiles or beam attacks. Mystery Creature. I'd count this as the second boss fight in the game personally, also rather dull as it takes place in first person mode and nothing else. All you need to do is be quick with hitting the tail before you get hurt and killed as Samus is pinned down, also pretty boring boss fight. Goyagma. A bit more interesting than the previous boss fights as you fight it on top of the volcano as it tries to smash you with its long arms and with its fire spit. Here you have to break its arm with ice beam attacks and missiles before being able to attack its head. Not the most interesting of boss fights, but a step up from previous ones. RB176 Ferrocrusher this is a yellow machine operated by the deleter and you are unable to see the driver's face at any times. It will try to drive over you and sometimes shoot missiles at you. Once you've destroyed its targeting system it will move frantically until you stun it by freezing the wheels. Then all you need to do is blast it with missiles. Not very interesting either but it becomes more challenging than the previous bosses at the very least. Warash. This is the only unique boss fight to this game that is great. Previously you've seen this creature in the background, as well as it trying to eat you. Wars is a fire fish that comes jumping out of the lava while spitting fire orbs at you. This is your cue to shoot it in the stomach. It also swallowed a grapple beam grappler, so once it pops out the lava, 
you can catch it to pull it up from the ground, giving you ample time to attack it for major damage. Very hectic and enjoyable boss fight that can bring you a great challenge. Ridley. Ridley is always a blast to fight in any Metro game, and this time is no exception. This boss fight expects you to have a fast reaction time as you blast Ridley with your plasma beam, and super missiles. Ridley uses his iconic tail attack against you, as well as his fire breath, while flying around the battle arena, even picking up Samus and grinding her against the wall as he flies around it. A great boss fight that even kills me once in a while. Nightmare. Before authorizing the gravity control on Samus' suit, she fights against the Nightmare in his pure mechanical mode, using his gravity core against you, making the gravity pull Samus down, making her more heavy than usual, as well as charging towards her in high speeds on a circular battle arena, forcing you to use the grapple points to even get higher up in the room. This is only his first phase though, as he makes a return once you defeated him and are on your way back, this time revealing his ugly green face as well. This time his gravity core doesn't work as you have the gravity suit activated. Missiles on the other hand are still affected by the gravity, so the gravity core must be frozen before being able to attack the nightmare head on. Very fun boss fight that can catch you off guard if you expect nightmare to be dead. Metroid Queen The Metroid Queen makes its amazing return as a boss in this game as well. It begins by launching Metroid towards you that you have to kill before even being able to attack the Metroid Queen head on. Once the Metroids are dead, you need to attack the crystal on her neck while avoiding her beam attacks and the charges. The boss fight ends with a throwback to Metroid 2 Return of Samus with the Metroid Queen swallowing Samus and forcing you to kill her with a power bomb. Very nice nostalgic trip and pretty challenging boss fight the first time around. Very enjoyable to fight against it as well. MB. The final boss of the main game, barely worth calling it a boss fight as all you need to do is scanning MB and the boss fights end with a cutscene. Very disappointing final boss where the way of defeating her is discovered by mistake. Fantoon. The true final boss of the game and he makes this glorious return from Super Metroid with his amazing eye plasma as well as new attacks in forms of shadow hands and beam attacks. Gets stronger if you have 100% and more enjoyable to fight against. Pops his eye and weak spot back and forth between dimensions while opening dimensional gates he attacks you from. Destroying the entire control room blocking your path as well as forcing you to move to the end of the game. He's a challenge and loads of fun to fight against with two different death animations, depending if you kill him with a finishing move or not. Nice throwback to Super Metroid by including it even if the game is a letdown overall, but definitely the best boss fight of the game. That moves us to the actual ending of the main game and post game ending. The main game ending have you meeting the Galactic Federation trying to seize the remnants of the station, as well as a sole survivor known as Madeline Bergman. Turns out that Anthony, which was presumed dead from the Ridley boss fight, is still alive and thanks to him, Madeline Bergman is safe from the Galactic Federation. Remember me? The post-game ending have you go back to the command center where Adam sat to bring back his helmet, as well as his final Donald Blade Conic. Lucky enough, they included the iconic escape sequence from the station at this point, but instead of being in Samus' Varia suit, she's in her Zero suit, making the escape a bit more of a challenge. At least the escape is enjoyable. So ultimately, is this a good or bad Metro game? It's up to you to decide, but personally I think the game is as much Metro as a potato is. But well, I do have fun with the latter half of the game, once you've gotten the wave beam, I find that the overall experience is to be a complete letdown. Especially as I pre-ordered this game at full price, only to have it fall to an incredibly cheap price that truly reflects the quality of the game. Very little of this game is Metroid mechanically, and the music is barely anything to mention, as most of it are ambient sounds or heard just for a few seconds. The story is dull and are dragged out more than necessary. 
The whole scanning section was super dumb and removed the flow of the game, especially when you don't find what to scan. The gameplay is closer to Ninja Gaiden than it does Metroid, and in the end, to me that is a huge disappointment as I was after the Metroid experience. Funny enough, I have beaten this game four times, it's not the longest game, and it's easy to play through quickly, but if you are looking for a good Metro experience, you are better off looking elsewhere. A special thanks to my Patreon pledger, Patrick Peterson and Hikikomori Media. Thank you everyone for watching this review, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed it, like it if you did. And follow me on Facebook as Elpigrodus, Twitter as FrogFaceR or Elpigrodus, or on Instagram as Elpigrodus. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next review. See you 